literally 30 people in that kitchen. All hourly employees. Not making a huge amount of money. It wasn't tied up in the individual pay. It was just raw numbers of people. And then I went into the corporate office, corporate office, and there were another 30 people of various and sundry backgrounds being paid. Uh, I think the lowest one was being paid uh, $60,000 a year to do a job she had never done in her life. To do a job that it was her first real job out of college, for which her degree was theater. And she was part of the marketing team. That's not really hit upon me without some of the foreign funding. I mean, it seems like wouldn't that be a bit of a check and balance where one would think so. However, one of the things I learned a couple of very interesting things about Silicon Valley. One is they have, because they make so much money. Um, they have the mentality when it comes to investing in other companies, startups, um, what they call spray and pray, where they'll take about $25,000, $30,000. And they were a startup once too and needed money. So they feel a certain amount of compassion towards anyone who's following after them. And so they give them $25,000, which in their world doesn't mean a whole lot. And you get about 10 people that do that and you have a quarter million dollars. And if you can get two or three people that have deeper pockets, you can get any, and once they're in, you go back and say, hey, look, we're making so much progress. We just need a little bit more. So they do it again. The other interesting thing about Silicon Valley that I learned was that they have an interesting way of looking at disaster. In the restaurant hospitality world, if like the kitchen crashes, that's a disaster because now you have a dining room full of very unhappy customers who all want free meals. They probably want to eat free for the next three weeks. Um, and in Silicon Valley, where they're developing various apps and various models and so forth, in that world, if it crashes, it's because more people than they had assumed would use it, were using it. And it overloaded the system when it crashed it. And that was a reason to celebrate because they were so successful, the system crashed. So they'll spend the next week and they'll prop it back up again and wait for it to crash again. And they'll wait and then they'll take another week and prop it back up again. And then they'll wait for it to crash again and that's how they grow. And so when, they would crash, not recognizing the ripple effect that, that had. They would celebrate that. They thought that was great. What they didn't realize was what kind of an impact that was having on their attrition of all of their customers. So the first thing that we ended up doing was putting systems in place for their kitchen. They had three R&D chefs in one that arguably you could have hired a consultant as you went. They wanted to actually hire an R&D chef. A real R&D chef that's really good is a six figure uh, asset, easily. And so, um, in fact, I'm working with one who used to be the she used to be the R&D chef for Focus Brands, and she was making $160,000 a year plus bonuses, stock options, and benefits. And then she was stolen away by somebody who in, in Dallas that was paying her like $200,000 a year to run R&D. So they, uh, to get a good one, they make really good money. So they better be really, really good. Well, they didn't see paying that kind of money, so they were hiring just other chefs, not R&D chefs, just production chefs. We don't know anything about R&D. And so they had a catalog of menu items that um, at least half of the menu items were a disaster. People hated it. 
And so they would go through this kind of, I called it a whiteboard R&D session where every week deciding what they were gonna serve a couple of weeks out. They would sit down and they would determine that the meals that they wanted to serve and what recipes they needed to come up with between now and then. Now in the world of R&D, you would do things like you would make it and then you would standardize the recipes and you cost it out and you look at how much labor it took to actually produce it on a consistent basis and what kinds of ingredients you're going to have to bring in special for that and what the cost of that was going to be and what the availability of those are going to be. And in this world, you need things to know things like shelf life of the finished product because they cook their product, blast chill it, package it, and sell it to you. And all you have to do is put it in a microwave or an oven and heat it up. You don't have to cook it. So in anywhere from five to 15 minutes, you're ready to go. And then you can just take that and throw it away and be done. So that whole thing, does it fit in the container? How does it look in the container? How does it travel? All of those things are all R&D questions that were never really being discussed. So they rolled this brand new menu that they allowed to be produced without any trans any kind of um, uh, visibility at all. And they went and found that when they launched it at the beginning of January, everybody hated just about everything that was on the menu. So the first thing that we had to do is we had to develop a menu. And in about six months, we put together a brand new catalog of 150 items 50 menus, 50 menu items that um, produced a food cost of 22%. Now, in the world of restaurants, that's amazing because restaurants will run 30% food costs. And so we were coming in at 21, 22. In some cases, we had menu items that were 19%. I was beginning to wonder if we were just crazy or what. And I talked to this focus brand, R&D chef, and she said, you know, the original sandwich that everybody likes, I said, yes, this is 19%, so don't do that. So um, we actually were able to produce it. The second thing that they had was um, they had never taken inventory. So they had no idea what their food cost was at the time that I stepped in. So there were no real systems that were germane to the industry that they wanted to be a part of. There was no labor tracking. In fact, they used an app to save money that allowed people to, if they wanted to, to actually clock in from their house and then drive into work. Saved them money. They used a service for a telephone system that they found online that was free that went out of business. And so they lost their number that was on their website. So they were paying for commute time. Well, that's a... Uh, I know, right? That's pretty cool. <laughs> Especially to them. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that I had is I thought about what we do in the startup world. In today's environment, it's different than being a startup 20, 30 years ago. In today's world, you have to be a disruptor. If you look at all of the major forces within our economy today, all of the major changes that have taken place, they've all happened because people have gone into an industry and completely turned it on its head. For example, when was the last time, and maybe there are collectors here, so I could be wrong, when was the last time anybody here actually went and bought a vinyl album? <laughs> <laughs> like I said, there are some nostalgic people, but overall, people don't do that. I talk to a millennial, and they've never even seen a vinyl album. Literally never seen. Heard about it, but never seen one. I know. People are going to want that little scratchy sound you hear. Yeah, right. right. I just bought a new car 
which is another story in another cell. I just bought a new car, and not only did it have, not have like a, a cassette player, it had a CD player, it had a DVD player so that you could watch movies, and it had a jack that you could hook up different kinds of electronic devices in the glove box, as well as a slot for a memory card. A memory card where on your own stereo system you could build your own playlist and you just plug that in. That's a completely different world. Now think about the vinyl album here for a minute. And it wasn't that long ago that because of file sharing, the major record labels thought that they were going to win that war of file sharing by suing 12 year old children because they shared a music file with their buddy. It just wasn't it. Think about it for a minute because when that change that world changed and they pushed back hard. Artists could no longer produce that one song that everybody loved and buried in an album of crap, like they did in the 70s, right? Everything had to be good because now you could buy just one song. You didn't have to buy an album. So if the artist only ever produced one good song, you're not buying any of their albums. It doesn't matter how many albums they put it on, because they can go on to online and buy just that one song and there's nothing that stops it. It's legal. So they took that whole world and kind of flipped it on its end. If you look at the movie industry, how fast do movies go from theater to streaming to you can buy the DVD? Used to be you'd have to wait a year or two before you could get it. Now, you can have a blockbuster movie with Tom Cruise and within three months have it streaming. And then a couple of weeks after that, you can buy the DVD. And you could have pre-ordered it before the movie even debuted. It's a whole different world. And so the, the, the startup companies that have done well are those that go into sectors and turn it on their head. Now, the sector that I'm in, the home rail replacement, is a billion dollar industry. And the largest reason for that is there are two large markets that we deal with. One is we deal with um, baby boomers, usually empty nesters. You never, until you've gone through it, you don't realize how hard it is to go from buying groceries for a family of six to two and have that happen overnight. At least overnight by perception, right? And then the other world is the millennials that do not go to restaurants the same way that we did when we were their age. When we were their age, we were going to restaurants on Friday nights because that was our Friday night was to go and, and stand three deep at the bar and hang out and blow a hundred bucks on, on drinks, maybe more. For them, nine times out of 10, if they're going to a restaurant, it's out of utility, not out of entertainment. And so for them, it means how can I eat what I want within this parameter? And it's usually things like 400 calories, high in protein. The packaging has to be recyclable or compostable, sustainable. And um, if not, you're out the door. 